Hi, it's Joe Mazum, our Exploration Insights uh, at the Virtual Metals Investor Forum uh, in September. And, and, and today I've got with me CEO of Regulus Resources, John Black. John, how's it going? Good. Good to see you, Joe. Hey, uh, John, I mean, uh, your Regulus Resources have a significant resource like that you're hoping to grow with your drill program in northern Peru. And uh, right now, the copper market is interesting. You know, copper prices have been rising. You know, the industrial production in China has been coming up. But for me, what's interesting more in the medium term is that the lack of projects that fit this 2025 deficit that's projected, um, you know, in the copper market. And there's very few projects and even fewer held by a junior. So how does Regulus fit into that picture? Well, it's, it's been very much part of our strategies. As you recall, this is our second company and we've been operating with the, the same strategy that what we specialize is, is identifying these projects that have potential to be very large copper or copper gold deposits. Um, and ones that can be economically very attractive when, when they're drilled out. And then we, we drill those out, we de-risk them, and then ideally we sell those to a major company. And we're not the only ones that have done that. The Lumina Copper Group and various Lundin companies and others have done the same, used the same strategy quite successfully over the years. But most, the common denominator for most of the companies like us is that we're experienced explorationists with a lot of uh, time in big companies before. And we're kind of cleaning the shelves. We've, we've really identified most of these opportunities that are out there. And so there are very few left in the hands of juniors. And when and the, the few that are there, when we get into a, a situation that we're entering now with quite elevated gold prices, and I think a very good case that copper prices will be increasing as well soon, is the major companies are looking to acquire these type projects. And when there aren't many of them, you, you almost get the perfect storm when you're delivering exactly what they're looking for at the point they're looking for them. Well, I mean, the, the other thing is that, you know, you've got, you know, one of the, you know, uh, issues about, about Anticori and Antinorte is, you know, the complicated land structure. But in another respect, it's interesting because you the, the other uh, uh, people like, which is one of Ventura and Southern, uh, Southern Copper are actually drilling out their deep sulfide project uh, and and that seems to have a significant resource so it's it's not just Anticori and Antinorte but potentially a combination that makes the most sense. Exactly it's 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 both a challenge and a, and a tremendous opportunity for us because it is a complex district we have a portion of a much larger deposit when you take into consideration what the neighbors have on it and and that's one of the reasons why this probably hasn't uh, move to the stage of being a large sulfide mine yet is because of that that complicated land situation over the years. So what we're, we're essentially almost a brownfield situation with the neighbors mining the oxide cap over their large copper gold sulfide resource that which extends onto our ground and we have a pretty good portion of it. So there's a, a, a natural transition for this district to move from the oxides which will be depleted in about 2025 to begin mining the underlying sulfides. And we believe that our, our resource, a portion of the district that we have right now is, is key to being able to uh, expand into the, uh, the optimal, the large, um, highly profitable sulfide project that really has to involve our ground as well as the neighbor's ground. So, I mean, we're talking about a, a deposit that's right now operating as an open pit heap leach. On Correct. the top of what we call a uh, high sulfidation epithermal system. But in the roots of it, we're basically collapsed onto a porphyry system. And then the system transitions onto your ground into what seems to be a SCARN deposit. And so what is the objective now with Regulus, you know, given that you've got a significant resource and a basically uh, an entry into the negotiating table with anybody who wants to consolidate the district, what value add is drilling more to, you know, to this place called Antinorte? As you mentioned, our, what we already have is a nice resource with between inferred and indicated over 500 million tons of, of quite attractive grades to it. So it's a very good question. Do we, do we need more, particularly when we combine ours with the, the neighbors on it? But as we move from, from our, our resource that we have right now towards the north, we get more into that SCARN and porphyry environment. And one of the advantages to that is, is that the mineralization is a cleaner style of mineralization. It has less arsenic, 
the high sulfidation mineralization that's predominant on the southern part of our project and onto the neighbor's project to the south uh, requires additional treatment costs to, to handle the arsenical nature of the mineralization. So as we find additional mineralization to the north, we anticipate that that will be metallurgically easier to process and would be would shift the center of gravity on the project more to our ground it'd be more logical to start with our ground which makes our mineralization more valuable if you're at the front end of a mine instead of the back end of a mine so i mean um what i get the impression on is is that the development projects i mean we know that copper and uh, production from copper is COVID 19 the pandemic moved to the americas and hit latin america we've seen a lot of major copper producers like like chile and Peru get impacted negatively with respect to production, but they're also getting negatively impacted with respect to development because of you know construction and having all these people there like with Quebrada QB2. So um, right now, uh, what we've seen in Peru is you know you're talking about arsenic ore and that, uh, and and you, some of what you're dealing with on your asset is what Newmont is dealing with at Yanacocha, and they're looking at building an autoclave, and so. How does that fit into that district in, in Cajamarca with respect to you developing potentially an arsenic rich concentrate, which is the same thing that actually Newmont is permitting right now? At well, it's, it's interesting on a, on a worldwide level, we're seeing uh, the uh, contents of arsenic and concentrates go up overall. So we're seeing more and more companies um, seek solutions on how to be able to process um, Lower grade, constant, lower grade copper deposits and more arsenical copper deposits as well on this. Uh, and then particularly in the district we're in, we're seeing that even, even more come into focus. So what one of the things we're noting is that um, with these elevated gold prices, gold companies are perhaps a little more aggressive on M&A than, than the copper companies at the moment on this. And, and it means that because of the, the strong precious metal component that we have, that Anticori will be a copper dominant project, but it has a very significant gold component to it, gold silver component to it. And so as we interact more with the precious metal companies, it's interesting to note that they're actually fairly comfortable with dealing with refractory ores. Uh, they, most of them have autoclaves at, at operations around the world. And, and an autoclave is a very good way to, to solve the arsenical problem on this. It, you sequester the arsenic into a stable mineral called scoridite, and it's easier to store and environmentally much safer. It has a high capital cost with it. So to, to support an autoclave, you need a lot of mineralization of pretty good grade. That's what we have in the Anticori opportunity. That's what Yanacoche has down the road as well. So we're very anxious to see them move that forward. It, it'd be a great example for us only 35 kilometers away of what we envision our district is a, is a good opportunity to go forward with, so. But I mean, the end game here is not just to develop your anti-quarry or potentially what you find Antinorte, uh, Antinorte, sorry, but the whole district because that actually makes the most sense from developing an open pit and not having to, you know, with laybacks worry about property boundaries or that, just take the whole thing. It makes the most sense. And, and if, you, if, you, if you consolidate the district in some manner, it allows you to, let your pit find its optimal position and, and, and produce at, at a proper rate that gives you the best return on investment. It's also um, important too for a larger mine provides much more benefits for the local communities in terms of taxes and employment. And th this type of a project, one of the things we're really excited about is it's, it has potential to be what we refer to as a multi-generational mine. It's a type of mine that will go for decades, and and that allows much better infrastructure development in the area, and just it's a more sustainable operation. That's that's why many of the the gold companies are are interested in in participating in copper projects now. It's it's not only that copper provides a bit of a hedge against gold prices in the event that you need that, but it, many copper or copper gold deposits have much longer mine lives. And it's easier to build a big company or continue to grow a large company like a Barrick or a Newmont by having a participation in a, in a mine that's going to go for 30, 40, 50 years instead of a 10-year mine life. Yeah, that was uh, uh, basically Newmont's idea with Conga. It, it was basically a copper gold porphyry, but it had a long mine life. Yep. And the ability to take the people you already have in Peru where you're comfortably operating and then transfer them over to another major mining complex was a big advantage. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about COVID-19, the impacts of Peru, and Peru was one of those countries that was, you know, more, more adversely impacted. How does that impacted 
your exploration, permitting, and your access to the ground and what you're currently doing with respect to news flow? Well, as, as this hit in March, uh, we, were, we were all set. We finally received our permits to be able to drill to the, these exciting targets we have called Antinorte on the northern side of the, the project area. We were, we were literally ready to go. We had a, a drill rig on site when, when this really hit and we realized that we needed to, to shut things down and, and get uh, everybody out of the country that didn't live in Peru. So we, for the past six months, we've been on, on fairly limited ability to work. Uh, we can now have people go to our office under strict protocols. And, and just like the mines, we can begin to work in the field, but it, it has to be with uh, a lot of extra precautions to keep our people safe, which is, is very important, but also to, to make sure that we're not putting any of the communities that we work with in at risk and that they're comfortable with how we're working. So the first stage is that when the, when the, the regulations in the country, in Peru, allow us to go back to work, but the next stage is when we're certain that we can do it in a manner that everybody, all the stakeholders are comfortable with in the communities we work in. Keep in mind, we're in, in, in a remote area of Peru. It's, it's, it's not remote in the sense of, it's, it's only two hours from a major city to drive to, but there's small communities. And many of these communities have mostly elderly people living in the communities. The younger people migrate to the city. And so they're very concerned about being exposed to, to COVID-19. And our presence uh, is a risk for them. So we, we have to do our work in a manner that they're comfortable with how we're doing. Now, having said that, many of the people in these communities do like employment. And so they, it's, it's the same struggle we're seeing worldwide on this is how do, you, how do you keep things moving forward and keep people employed and keep the economy working, but at the same time, keep people safe. So that's why it's taken us a little bit longer to get things set up. But we're, we're um, advanced now in being able to establish an independent camp um, we, we can't work from the mine the way we have in the past. We've had agreements with the neighbors that allow us to use mine infrastructure and work from there. They have very limited space now under the new protocol, so they can't accommodate us. So we've had to establish our own proper camp to move forward. But that's, that's moving along well, and we anticipate we'll be able to drill towards the end of September or earliest October. Okay, so, so for anybody looking at Regulus right now or already a holder, we should be looking at drilling actually on the ground in Antonorte, like not drilling on the edge of it, but actually getting right to your magnetic. Right, right into testing the principal targets in the north on that. We still have a little bit of work in the main area to do. We've got a couple gaps in there that are um, likely highly mineralized. We just don't have the density of drilling we need to do. So what we're, we'll, when we reinitiate work here in a few weeks, what we'll be doing is completing our phase two program. Our phase two program was nominally estimated to be 25,000 meters. We've completed about 16,000 meters. And the next uh, nine or 10,000 meters to complete that program will be about eight to 10 holes testing the new targets in Antonorte and probably five or six holes finishing up, uh, filling in gaps um, between Antonorte and the main project area. And when we complete that phase two program, that will allow us to do an updated resource next year. Uh, best estimate would be probably Q2 of next year to have that updated resource out. And then, then our, our phase three program will be the drill program designed to, to drill out what we find with those initial scout holes into Antonorte. So we anticipate once we start drilling, we'll likely have continuous drilling for the rest of this year and all of next year, most likely. Okay, great. All right, thank you, John. That's John Black, regular CEO. Thanks for joining us. Yep, thank you very much, Joe. Thanks for the opportunity. Always good to catch up with you. Okay, uh, it's Joe Mazumdar, our Exploration Insights uh, at the Metals Investment Forum virtual conference uh, in September. Thank you very much for joining us and hopefully that was helpful. Thank you.